Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Standing Our Holy Ground webinar series about gun violence and what the church can do about it. Thank you for being with us today. This is a year-long webinar series uh, delving into the question, what can the faith community do to address gun violence? We are on to our 12th webinar in the series, and today we have a discussion about um, how during the current COVID-19 pandemic, Americans are not only stockpiling uh, everything from toilet paper to hand sanitizer, but they are purchasing massive amounts of firearms and ammunitions. Uh, so it's uh, a special webinar for the season that we're in. Uh, this series is hosted by the Presbyterian Peacemaking Program along with our um, colleagues in the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship. My name is Carl Horton. I am the coordinator for the Presbyterian Peacemaking Program and my colleague Simon Dune is monitoring the webinar platform to make sure, at least we hope, that everything goes smoothly for us. Quickly, let's overview the common understandings that we have developed and are using to um, as we move through the webinar series, these understandings uh, are to set a baseline for our conversation, uh, to guide our discussion, and to uh, center us as we talk about a complicated issue. So we'll review them quickly. Gun violence is a public health epidemic that impacts our communities, congregations, and members, whether they know it or not. The impact of gun violence is disproportionate. It affects some individuals and communities often and others seldom. We must first understand the impact of gun violence by listening to its victims, survivors, and those who experience it. The gun violence prevention movement is not anti-gun. The Second Amendment does not preclude reasonable, sensible gun violence prevention legislation. Addressing gun violence will require changes in the legislation and culture of our nation. The Presbyterian Church USA has issued clear policy and strong statements on preventing gun violence, but true change requires action and advocacy by our members and congregations. As people of faith, we must pay attention to the discrepancies between the teaching of our faith tradition and the messaging of media and special interest groups. This webinar series is an opportunity for constructive conversation and learning and not for the posturing and polarizing rhetoric that has characterized the gun violence. <clears throat> and finally, panelists and participants in this webinar series will demonstrate mutual respect, listen for understanding, and engage in a way that bears witness to the best values and practices of their faith tradition. Okay, before we get, um, before we move on, let me just review with you um, the uh, way in which you who are viewing the webinar uh, today in real time uh, can, we hope, submit questions. Um, there is a Q&A tab in your Zoom control panel. If you hover over that, it will open and allow you to post a question. Um, we really, we will save time at the end for questions, which as we always do, but we really do encourage you to post those questions. Don't wait to post the questions. Post them as they come to you so we can um, have those ready for our panelists when we get to that point. Um, let us know which panelist you want to speak to and uh, if one or the other, and please be guided by our common understandings as you um, phrase your questions. Let me introduce our two panelists for today for this particular webinar. Uh, our first panelist is my colleague, Reverend Dr. Lori Krauss, who is the Director of Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. Uh, she oversees domestic and international response initiatives. She appreciate, appreciates the opportunity to serve as the face of PDA. She interprets our mission in churches, presbyteries, and synods, and teaching developing curriculum and writing for various publications. She leads and supports collaborative efforts with neighboring ministry areas in the PCUSA and among ecumenical and neighboring 
uh, ecumenical and interfaith partners in disaster uh, response. Lori is a certified compassion fatigue professional and has adopted certification and expertise and has additional certification and expertise with the International Critical Stress Foundation and in training response in public violence events. Her 30 years of pastoral experience includes doctoral work and graduate level teaching, both in theology and practice of ministry and disaster and in multicultural ministry practice. Our second panelist is Reverend Robert uh, Hoggard, who earned his bachelor's degree from American Baptist College and his master's degree from Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School, both in theological studies. In his master's thesis, he explored bridging the gap between the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black church. Robert leads the, Metro, the board at Metro Justice as its vice president. In his role, he is assisting in the formation of the Rochester Police Account Accountability Board and pushing for an end to cash bail and new discovery and speedy trial laws. He's also currently earning his PhD in education at the University of Rochester. His dissertation is where the K-12 education system, public policy, workforce development, and higher education meet. It will ex explore P-TECH, a grade 9 through 14 model where students earn the necessary academic, technical, and professional skills to complete, compete in the workforce. Robert works to see an ed education system that prepares brown and black people for college on, or work rather than the street corner or our prison system. Robert was also a panelist uh, on our webinar um, recently that discussed the racial divide in gun violence. So welcome uh, back, Robert, and thank you, Lori, for being with us today. Yeah, thanks so well, much. Yeah, it's good to have you both with us from your homes. Um, <laughs> we're all coming, we're all at home. Um, so um, before we uh, begin in the conversation, we thought we might share some of the um, statistics and news that led us to want to create an additional webinar that uh, dealt with this particular context of the pandemic um, and explored why in the world would people in this time be buying uh, additional um, um, guns and ammunition. So um, federal, here are a few few statistics that we have we found. Federal data analyzed by the New York Times um, showed that in March 2020, it was the second busiest month ever for gun sales in the U.S., so just last month. Um, online firearms retailer Ammo.com said that it experienced a 309% increase in revenue between February 23rd and March 15th compared to the previous 22 days. As of April 1st, the site reports it experienced a 792% increase in revenue from February 23rd to the end of the, month, uh, end of the month of March. Our growth in sales directly correlates with the public's increasing leeriness of COVID-19, the company website reads. From the Federal Bureau of Investigation, it says that 3.7 million background checks for firearms purchases were conducted in March, the most ever recorded in a single month by the Bureau, and over 1 million more than in March uh, of 2019. Over 210,000 background checks were conducted on March 20th, just in a single day, the new record for the most ever on a day. And Small Arms Analytics and Forecasting, which is a research uh, firm focused on the global firearms market, estimates that the back, those background checks indicate that, a, that about 2.5 million guns were purchased in March, up 85.3% from the same time of the previous year. So um, our next, we just wanted to show folks this uh, New York Times um, chart, which um, is based on analysis of federal data. Uh, uh, it illustrates the increase in gun sales over the last 
four months. We can see that Americans bought about 2 million guns in March. It was the second busiest month ever, trailing only January 2013, if you all can see that. It's a little small, but um, just after, um, so it only trails 2013, January, right after President uh, Barack Obama's reelection. And if you'll remember the um, mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in December of 2012. The article that this chart comes from also hints at the reasons, reason why people are purchasing firearms. Uh, quote, people are nervous that there's a certain amount of civil disorder that might come if huge numbers of people are sick and a huge number of institutions are not operating normally, said Timothy Lighton, a law professor at Georgia State University and an expert on the gun industry. He goes on, they may have an anxiety about protecting themselves if the organs of state are starting to erode. So those, that sort of sets the landscape um, for us, at least um, some of the statistics over the last couple of months as we've entered into this season of pandemic. So um, I think what we'll do, um, we had talked previously about this. There are a number of questions I think that we, came up with uh, to frame this webinar. So I think I'll start with the first one and invite both Lori and Robert for both of you just to give us a response. Um, so just to begin, why do you think people are stockpiling uh, ammunitions and weapons when we are in the midst of this crisis, this pandemic? Lori, do you wanna start? Sure, I'd be glad to, thanks. Um, and good to be here, Carl and uh, Robert and Simon and others. Um, I think people stockpile weapons. I think your chart shows it, um, the graph shows it. People stockpile weapons when they're, when they're activated, when their fear centers are activated. When people um, feel out of control, uh, when people feel that uh, the circumstances surrounding them increase the level of threat to their personal well-being or to the well-being of people they love. Um, people who, who think of weapons or, or firearms as a, um, as, a, as a good antidote to being out of control by weapons. And I think that it's as simple as that. People are afraid right now. Um, people are afraid of what the future is going to hold. There's, a, there's an increasing sense of scarcity. There's an increasing sense of, um, of alarm that civil society is in fact not intact. And um, an antidote to that is trying to make yourself feel safer. Mm. Okay. Robert, what would you add to that? Yeah, of course you, you get at that fear. Um, but also I, I, you, I think we see when people don't see action from churches, from government, they want to take action in their own hands, right? And it's that let, let's buy guns to defend ourselves. To to we don't we you know we we're we're fearing the unknown, but we're not sure how the government might step in and maybe to take our guns or um, maybe things get worse and maybe riots start, you know. And so it, it's almost like as even economists are saying how we we could the longer we're in this we could teeter to depression. You know, people are, are, are sort of trying to get ready. Um, and um, uh, in that phase, we, we just have to see government, which we can talk about later, government and churches, uh, which we will focus on today, really stepping in to sort of bridge that gap of, of people really afraid of what is to come. Yeah. You know, I think of like, um, along these lines, why people are doing this. I mean, we all ran to get toilet paper and hand sanitizer because that we're going to need this, and there, we're, there's this concern about <clears throat> scarcity. And so I, I understand some people feel like, I need my gun, I need a gun. Um, do you think scarcity was a part of that, or was it more a secure, it, it sounds like you're both saying it's more of a security uh, it, during a pandemic, because uh, a, a gun for some is a sort of a security thing. Um, for me, it might not be. I'm, I probably wouldn't go get a gun. I might add locks to my front door. I might get a security system if I felt uh, afraid. But for many, it, it's not, wasn't a scarcity 
concern, like it would have been when the U.S. administration changed to Barack Obama. I think people were afraid, again, that fear that they weren't going to be able to purchase guns anymore. I, I think that there's both, I, I think that there's a couple of narratives. Um, I think the scarcity narrative and also the scarcity of civil security um, that mm -hmm. the government might not be there to help us, that things might fall very badly apart um, is part of that. I also think that there's a larger narrative, and I, I'm seeing it in my global work as well, that, that this dynamic between um, authoritarianism and liberty has intensified during the COVID pandemic mm -hmm. so that um, people feel that their civil liberties might be being infringed by the, by the uh, by the focus on public safety. Mm -hmm. And I think here in the U.S. that may play out by people extrapolating from that. Well, they're taking away my liberty. They're not letting me go shop. They're not letting me go do things I normally do. Maybe the next thing is they're going to take away my guns and I won't be able to get them. So I'll just get some now and, and then I'll be prepared. Gotcha. Yeah, and I, I do, I have heard that concern about our liberties as our government, our governments, local, state, <coughs> and national are putting restrictions on us. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I do see that as a dynamic at play here. Um, our second question, I think we could move to the next one, is, um, you know, when we're in a time of crisis, and Lori, you spend your ministry dealing with crisis in particular, but um, we wondered if both of you, because you're both theologically schooled and trained and theologians who think about these things through the a lens of our faith, um, when we're in a crisis or disaster, what do you think is the distinction between a fear-based and faith-based response? So, you know, as people of faith, we want to have faith and trust and hope, and we have that. But, but fear can also grip us. So I think from a crisis, you know, we're not all in disasters or we, none of us have really ever been in a pandemic, I think. What do you th think the dynamic between fear and faith is? And then we also wondered about thinking in terms of the season in which this uh, event has happened or at least begun for us. We were in the midst of Lent and Easter. Have either of you considered this through that lens of the liturgical year and how that might be relevant for us as we talk about this? Yeah, so, um, I mean, this is, this is a tough time and it is so easy to, to be fearful. Um, and, you know, we always talk, when we turn, talk about faith, we always talk about faith is the substance of things hoped for, that was the thing not seen, right? And um, it, it, is, it is that believing in God with, with, with what we do not see, right? And there are so many things that are unknown, there are so many things that we do not know, but we trust God at the end of the day um, that God is, is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, and that, 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 that we're, we're, we'll be taken care of in the end. Um, but in that process, we have to we have to put ourselves in the shoes of those who might be fearful. We have to think about statistics like um, in in Richmond, Virginia, all of um, the um, the, uh, the people who died from COVID have been African American, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you look at uh, uh, the statistics um, of of African Americans of what's and, and what folks are facing because if there are, are underlying issues that already exist, COVID um, exacerbates those issues. And so um, we, there, are, there are issues that we already haven't been talking about. And now the, this sort of uh, pandemic makes those issues worse. Mm -hmm. And so we have to remember that it is so easy for people who are in dire need to, 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 to just feel the, the, the strain of, of us not doing enough government not doing enough, church is not doing enough, and to really um, listen to people and talk to them and, and actually try to meet their needs the best we can. And so that's, that's what I would say to that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, um, I appreciate you uh, bringing up the disproportionate effect on the African-American community and other communities of color, Robert, um, because that's part of what informs 
both uh, what I want to say now about the role of fear in faith, not the role of faith as an antidote to fear, but the role of fear in faith, and also um, why I think we are so ill-equipped, and by we, I mean uh, people who, um, whose, whose color and socioeconomic location makes us more privileged. And as a Presbyterian minister in a denomination that's, what, 91, 92% uh, um, white, there's a lot of us who exist in a, in a relative place of privilege. Um, relative to many of the communities that are being disproportionately hit. So what I would say about fear is this, that um, when we read the Psalms, particularly let's just take Psalm 23, um, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I, I think people who are accustomed to having privilege and a fair amount of security and, and many of us in the United States um, have that experience to a certain level, are not used to living our daily lives in the, in the valley of the shadow. And this pandemic has put us all in the valley of the shadow, some much more than other and much more acutely than other. But, um, but many of us who've never experienced a life of uh, deprivation or a life marked by, by sort of continuing fear that we have no power over, uh, are finding it really difficult to grapple with the fact of fear being a reality of our faith life right now. Um, I, I think that that institutes a period of disillusionment for us. And the Psalms sort of speak to that uh, in the Psalms of Lament, where David and others in the Psalms are continually saying, well, wait a minute, this wasn't supposed to happen to me. And I don't deserve this, and you should be smiting my enemy, not me. And, um, and that kind of lament, that kind of attack, that kind of complaint goes to our sense that life isn't like it should be, and that we deserve different than what we're getting. And I think that if we get through, if we're going to get through the valley of the shadow, uh, we have to pay attention to lament. We have to pay attention to the role of lament. We have to pay attention to the discomfort of not knowing and of not understanding how, why, and if our faith in God is going to save us in a certain way in this, uh, in this period of time. And that is a very Lenten story. That is not a triumphalist Easter story at all. Uh, it's, more like, it's more like the original ending of Mark. Uh, where um, the women come to the tomb and they find it empty and they, they hear the message that mm. he has gone before them and they don't understand it. And so they say nothing to anyone and they go away. And we're kind of more in that sort of an Easter right now than we're in the go to my people and tell them, you know, uh, we're, not in the, we're not in the Great Commission kind of Easter. We're in the other kind of Easter. And that's not an Easter that many of us are used to. But I do think that... Um, that the African-American community, Robert, that uh, other communities of color, that Native American communities have lived with the kind of discomfort all of us are now feeling forever and have learned to have faith and to be in faith and to build community um, even though circumstances are not um, happy, good, and, and uh, rewarding. And I, I, I'm trying really hard in this season to listen to my colleagues of color and the faith leaders that I know who have, who have um, lived with historic harm and dispossession um, because Lament is strong in, in communities that have suffered. And I need to learn more about Lament and how to live with it in a comfortable body and to do that work. Sorry, didn't mean to preach a sermon. No, in fact, I was just going to say, I hope you get the chance to preach that Easter message during this Easter season, because I, I, I certainly can relate to what you're saying. This is not a Great Commission Easter. This is a, a, a huddling in our homes, literally, and afraid of what's going mm -hmm. on outside. Um, to a locked room Easter. Yes. A locked upper room Easter. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And even though we've been told... He is not here. He's risen. Um, it's really hard to believe that or to see that, you know, we haven't touched it. So 
Um, Robert, any insights from your perspective on, on Lori's um, observations there? Yeah, I, I think that was very heavy um, and <laughs> not, 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 in a, not in a bad way, in, in, a, in a good way. We got, <laughs> you know, we, we, we really got to think uh, long and hard how marginalized communities are, are, are impacted and what we can actually do um, and uh, realize that that having the conversation um, and that listening to people are the first steps. Um, but after that, we after we find out what the problems are, we, we, we got to take our resources and we have to take um, our, our, every fiber of our being and, and actually serve and, and actually getting to um, sort of meeting that need that Jesus did uh, in the Gospels. In the Gospels, you see nothing but action. It, you know, Jesus is saying a lot of things. But he's but it, it's it's why he is doing things while he's healing people, while he's setting people free, while he's releasing the captives, um, and that's we have to we have to use that model uh, to 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 what we want to do in the world. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm going to move us to the third question just to make sure we get through them all and then have a chance to get to some of these really good um, observations and questions coming in from those who are watching. Um, we want to move on to the area of isolation. Um, you, you know, we all have been uh, asked to stay home. So there's a, a good degree of um, going, uh, going away to a quiet, well, not all of us are in quiet places, but we're all, <laughs> feeling, a bit, we're all feeling a bit isolated from one another. And, um, you know, we wanted to ask about the implications of isolation in a pandemic because theologically, um, you know, Jesus went to a quiet place, isolated himself, and that was a good thing. We have been um, ordered in many cases to stay home during a pandemic as a, um, as a way in which to uh, address this health crisis. But we also know that isolation leads to um, depression, anxiety, and senses of aloneness that would lead people to violence. So we wanted to reflect with you all a bit. Um, you know, isolation didn't lead people to buy these guns in this record amount, but now we have a lot of isolated people at home with an enormous amount of firepower and with guns. What, what are the implications of isolation in um, disaster and crisis, Lori, and um, Robert, what would your sense of, you know, you talked so eloquently last time about the intersections. I just wonder about aloneness and isolation in, in these times and what you think that's doing. I don't, who wants to begin? Lori, on this one? Is it your that's turn fine. to start? Sure. <laughs> okay. um, so let me do the positive part of isolation first. Um, which is, well, which is predominantly that we need to keep remembering that in isolating, we are serving our community. We are serving one another. This is how we practice love, by, by remaining isolated and not um, potentially bringing harm to another person. Uh, so that's an, it's an action, even though it's not really an action, it's staying home and not taking action but it is profoundly an action. And when I get uh, to, to the point where I'm really frustrated by being alone and I'm an extrovert, so I reached that point about the, you know, two days after they locked me up, um, I just try to remind myself that that is, that is my action of faith and of uh, solidarity with humanity to, to stay home. So that's one piece. And I and in tying to that spiritually, I was thinking about um, the monastic traditions, the desert fathers, the desert mothers, uh, the cloistered orders that really considered their isolation, their removal from society as an act of prayer on behalf of humanity. And I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I wasn't raised a Catholic and I, I would make a terrible monastic for so many reasons. Um, but in this period of pandemic, I really started thinking about in a different way, in a more understanding way about how people might choose to withdraw as a matter of spiritual purification, as a matter of uh, spiritual service to others. And so um, I, I kind of tied that to the pandemic for myself uh, in, in that way. And 
while I don't think that's an antidote for the many people who are struggling with anxiety and uh, depression in this, uh, for me, it, it, it's a way of kind of frame this. And of course, Jesus, when he withdrew into the wilderness, was the temptations are really a struggle with, um, with mental challenges, with isolation, with fear, with fear of being out of control. Um, if you kind of re go back and recontextualize the, um, the challenges that Jesus had in the wilderness, they were about protecting himself from scarcity, um, securing his power. Um, they, were, they were temptations he faced while in a, in a season of deprivation and loneliness to make different choices, to make choices that would secure his power buy guns maybe would have been the choice that he would have been offered, you know, uh, if he were being offered that choice today. So I, I think as we wrestle with the real negatives of isolation, we could think of those as temptations and, and sort of focus down on spiritual practice and self-regulation of our fear in order to, uh, to address those temptations in a way that's transformative and, faith, and faithful. Yeah, that, that I mean, Lori just says so much uh, uh, great things, and, and sometimes it's hard to pick up where she <laughs> left off. There's not much left to say, but what we what I'll add to that and say that this is this has been a time uh, for me that has really pushed spiritual formation, um, mm -hmm. and just just like you said, right? It's been a time for uh, many times we we um, sort of hinge ourselves on. The, the communal aspect of spirituality, but there's, there's something a little bit different about that personal spiritual formation in your prayer time, in your focused one-on-one -on -one time, um, um, in that sort of spirituality, spirituality piece that's just different than being in the church. And I, even as an introvert, I miss uh, uh, praise and worship. I miss being in that setting, and I miss h hugging people and showing that you love them, but um, I, I also do realize that all, while it's pushed me, uh, there are many people who are anxious and many people who in this, in this setting we're seeing um, who are more depressed. And one of the things I've been trying to do is um, look, just look through that phone book, look through people who have my contact. If I haven't talked to somebody, pick up the phone and talk to them. Pick up the phone and say, hey, I, I'm thinking about you. I love you. I care about you. Um, and when we do that, um, and, and we all could do that, that sort of, um, we're, we're noticing what it's doing to everyone, but we're saying, how can we be active in um, the sort of piece of people just feeling anxious and, and depressed? I'm just talking to a lot of people who are just, I'm anxious. Yeah, I, I get that we're flattening the curve. I get that we're, this is showing we love each other, but I, I just want to get out there, you know? And for me as an introvert, I, I, was, I was happy to, okay, I, I could watch Netflix, I could read some books. But the third weekend, I'm just like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm ready to get back out. You know, so it's weighing a toll on everyone, and we just have to remember to check on people, and and just it's it's just a tough time for folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, great answers. Thank you both, because I I do think um, we are in a, a season of isolation, and so to turn the um, so to not let that isolation, Laura, you you. Um, framed it as temptations in our isolation to actually um, be proactive with one another at helping that isolation not become loneliness, despair. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's much like in our last webinar, we talked to um, the folks at Sandy Hook Promise, and they really do a lot of education, but they also do a lot of relationship building. Um, and so helping people know how to notice signs and prevent and 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 so Robert I really think the practices of um, of of in the midst of this building intimacy across the six foot channel that we have or larger with each other how do we do that and I think we're seeing a lot of creative approaches to battling isolation that would become potentially violent. Um, let me move on to um, uh, one other area of conversation. Uh, and that, Robert, I want you to start on this one because I want to know a little bit about in the midst of a pandemic, um, you had said that um, 
you know, violence, gun violence is intersectional with all these other social concerns uh, and problems of society, poverty, unemployment, uh, unequal access to education and health. Um, tell us a little bit about the amplification of those when we're in a time of pandemic. Um, how does this pandemic Im amplify all of those issues? Right, and so, you know, if, if well, I love education, we can start with education. You're, you're seeing, like here, even here in New York State, where we spend, we, there is no other state that spends more than education than we do. However, we have to cut our, our education budget, right? And so some districts across the state have to see those cuts. Um, and you, yes, there's some cost savings for us not being in the classroom, but at the end of the day, we're still paying teachers, we're still paying the staff, and um, so when you, when you see a system that has to sort of cut back, then, then you see that. Then you see how the numbers, how many economists are saying that when you look at the unemployment numbers, they're teetering close to the numbers that you see, you saw in the De Great Depression. <laughs> you know, so folks are losing jobs and we don't know when the, you know, um, businesses will get jumped back up. We don't know when we'll be able to fully return to work. And that can take a toll on people um, because yes, I yes I may have um, some of those resources from unemployment, but we just don't know how long this is going to last, and we just don't know um, what happens. And so that even pushes if you were if you were already in a low wage job and you lose that job, it just that already sort of pushes um, and it just prods people to just just. Get, Get, be on edge and, 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 and just lose it and just get angry because things aren't really going in their, in their, in their favor. And we're seeing so many issues that way where it just, it, it, was all, it was already a major issue that was undealt with and not talked about from a government perspective. And now we're seeing where it's, it's just even growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And we just have to find our ways to, um, to curb it. So just with education and that, um, we see that um, that you know as those issues are, are heightening, we see that that crime with those issues are 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 are, are impactful because really we're focusing and as I said earlier in the um, other webinar that you know we talk a lot about controlling um, the you know, gun control and etc. But we don't talk enough about what pushes a person to pick up that gun in the first place, and it's that sense of helplessness, that sense of I, there's nothing else I can, I don't feel like I can do anything else to solve this issue. I don't feel like I can do anything else to solve my anger, my anxiety. I'm just going to go pick up a gun and, and solve this di dispute with this gun. I'm going to pick up a gun and, and, and rob a bank. Or I'm going to pick, it, it just, that sense of helplessness. And, and we got to curb that sense of helplessness. Yeah, I think you're on mute, Carl. I have oh. muted myself. Um, <laughs> Let's move on, and Lori, unless you, do you have a response on that one? I, I think the only thing I would add, I think Robert said almost all of it and, and well, um, the only thing I would add goes back to the isolation piece. Another thing that happens in isolation is you're only living in your own head and in your own world. So the interactions that we have with others, the interactions we have with people who are different, um, the awareness that we have of the circumstances of others is um, we have more control over that and we can choose not to be moved by that. We can choose to just live in our own world, which I think heightens the anxiety, the fearfulness, and the idea that we are in charge of figuring out what we're going to do to secure our own well-being, the things that you were saying, Robert, about that. Okay. Um, Simon, I'm going to have us look at both of the next questions together, um, just because we're getting some great questions from people tuning in. I want to have time to get to those. Um, we had wondered if you all could give us um, your insights on what faith communities can do during COVID-19 during this time. Um, you know, we're, and we're seeing creative things that congregations and places of worship are doing to maintain community. Um, and, and I'm thinking particularly in terms of uh, marginalized and, and vulnerable communities, um, and particularly in this time where um, people are, you know, the amplification of other problems, right? We're seeing the, 
the incredible amounts of um, need for food across the country. Um, the healthcare system is certainly stressed. What are your insights about what faith communities during during this particular season of disaster and crisis can do? And then the, the second question that we're going to put with that is that um, uh, maybe just to say a little bit more about issues that that are um, that are amplified. Um, either of you, from your experience, Lori um, or Robert, from yours with um, disaster and crisis like this um, related to suicides and homicides and, and uh, mental health issues. Um, what are some of those primary concerns related to the, this plethora of guns that we have always had, but now seem to have quite a few more um, in this particular time? And, and let's just quickly answer that so we can move to other questions. I'll jump in quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just so we could get to other questions too, I'll, I'll, I'll go really quick. Um, but I said in the last webinar, there, there are some organizations in each of you all cities that are already doing things and perhaps you can link uh, up with them to say, hey, we understand that you're already doing this effort on poverty. You're already doing this effort on education. How can we help? Um, because I really do understand and have been talking to pastors across the country, who their revenue streams are going down. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard, they're, they're saying we wanna help, but we have less resources to help. So find out who it is in your community um, that you can talk to, that, that, that um, you can partner with, um, and you can, you can provide them volunteers or whatever it is or whatever the case may be. You really wanna connect with the people who are already doing uh, the work and there are many people across all of the cities who are already sort of doing the work but may need more resources or may need more help. And so that's what I would, 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 would say for right now. Yeah, I would second that and say from, from my experience in um, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, we started a pretty substantive grant program in response to COVID-19 and then put the call out to um, uh, our regional bodies and our congregations to say what can, uh, we, we'd like to know what you can do and we'd like you to try to prioritize these limited funds in ways that will make the, the greatest impact. And we've been really amazed and thrilled because congregations that are, as Robert just said, vulnerable, experiencing declining uh, funds for themselves and their own operations are being incredibly uh, outwardly focused in a very missional way. And they're, they're saying, you know, we're having this, but our little restaurant had to close. Maybe we should take our little restaurant and, and keep paying our workers but instead give the food away to the day laborer pool that doesn't have any work at all now. So they're taking the, these small kind of grants and turning them into um, helping people who are undocumented and can't get food or, or assistance from the government, uh, partnering with vulnerable communities that they already know about with food banks, uh, reaching out to refugee resettlement communities to say, we know you must be really struggling right now. And, um, and being really creative about thinking who are the people that are the most on the margin in this moment and how can we bring the resources of the church to them and stand and walk alongside them. That's a great, great insight because I do think this time, as it's impacted all places of worship, all communities of faith, it really has made us, made them become creative, not only in how they gather, but how they um, reach the communities and the, the issues they address. So um, I appreciate that uh, creativity of, of um, response. Um, let me do a few of the questions, Simon, that are coming in from folks. Um, first one is just if either of you are aware if this dynamic of stockpiling uh, or escalation of gun sales has happened is unique to the U.S. or, or has that happened mm. globally? Is that just a U.S. thing, or is that happening around the world? Forrest asked that question. Anybody know? It's a good question. I do not know the answer to that question. Yeah, I'm not great sure. Either. Yeah, the great question. I'm not sure either, but perhaps we can find out and get it back to folks. Yeah, yeah. Or um, somebody Google it while we're on here and put the answer <laughs> into the chat. <laughs> So another question from Beth, she actually uh, posed too at the outset. Um, 
uh, she notes, let me just say part, what she wrote. Part of the overarching question that needs to be talked about is the number of states who deemed gun stores as essential services. Mm. Even while naming this the increase in domestic violence and suicide likely to happen during a pandemic. So there would be an escalation of violence and even in homes. Um, she tried to get her governor in Illinois to close gun shops and deem them, deem them non-essential. But after consulting with the lawyer, she says the governor would not. How can we address the irony in gun shops being essential and churches being non-essential? <laughs> it's an irony. It is. You know, it's also a judgment. Say more. I mean, it's a judgment. It's a judgment call for the governor who who, who makes that choice. Uh, but it's also, you know, in the church these days, in the U.S., we've been struggling with what is the relevance of the church to civil society? Uh, where are we making an impact? And, and what are we doing? So, in a way, not gathering in large groups to be with ourselves and to pray and to praise is, is just a sensible choice physically. But in another way, how much is the visible work that we do of being uh, present to those who are uh, who are dispossessed and 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 uh, without resources visible to, enough to civil society that people would say, "Oh no, we can't we can't close the churches. We depend on the churches to be there for the people who are victims of domestic violence and to be there um, to support emotionally." those who are frontline workers and to be there with food banks and other resources. Are we seen as essential to that process or not? So it's mm -hmm. an irony, but it's also a question, you know, if they close the churches, who would notice? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, I, where's, the, where's the impact it in that church? doesn't make me feel good, but. <laughs> right, yeah. doesn't make me feel good either, but it, that's powerful. If, if they close the church, what, you know, what, what would happen? And so, to build up that point, a very excellent point, I would also say um, that many of the public policy decisions that we're seeing being made are, you, you wonder if they're being made only for a person's election chances, right? To favor to a certain base, right? Um, and so what we have to dig, we, we have to dig deeper and push um, elected officials and push others to really, uh, to really start thinking about how are decisions made and why are we making certain decisions? Because when you, when you look at the decision, you can only say, ah, that's, that's only to please a certain subset of people, but we're really not thinking about safety. We're really not thinking about like actually um, being, uh, uh, you know, guarding the safety of, of people. We're just, we're just thinking about how do we win an election again? And we have to really, really talk about that. And we have to really, really educate our, our, our um, congregations about, that when they go to the polls, so they understand the ramifications of government when we are in pandemics, um, because it's it's a, it's a phenomenon that we got to really deal with. So I want to share Beth's other question because I think it's a good one, um, and it gets back to the previous webinar uh, that you were a part of for us, Robert. She asks, "How much does racist rhetoric, either subtle or more of overt?" play into the stockpiling of weapons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's, it's huge. It's, it's, that, it's that huge dog whistle marketing strategy to say, you know, we, 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 we have to have um, these sort of guns to protect ourselves. Um, and, and, and we have to ask the question, who are we, who are we, are they, protecting ourselves against mm -hmm. you know, what who are we saying is dangerous who are we saying are safe what communities are are we saying is that about what communities do we do we need to police what communities do we need to keep in control and we actually dig deeper into that it sort of sub it, it sections us into uh, a certain subject of marginalized communities that we we sort of say this rhetoric that um we, we should not govern off of control, but we should govern off of needs. And that's, that's what we really have to be talking about. The shutdown of immigration is a right. dog whistle that points to the notion 
that foreign people, others uh, are dangerous to us and in a time of pandemic, we need to make sure none of those people get in here. And then that ties directly to immigrant populations here in the US. This pandemic began and continues with a huge amount of anti-Asian uh, violence and, and racist rhetoric. Uh, even while this pandemic affects most disproportionately communities of color and especially African-Americans and it's documented, rather than thinking about wow, that's a vulnerable community that we need to respond to and try to make sure that they get the resources they need. We're instead doing the dog whistle thing about the nonviolent um, people being released from prison where they're more likely to get sick and, and moving toward the gun protection because the criminals are on the street. When in fact, it's, it's a lot of the cash bail folks that are being released in places that are doing humanitarian release right now or immigrants who are in detention, asylum seekers and refugees, but it's being turned to sort of a racist threat, this vague kind of threat of those people who are going to be putting us at risk during this time. Yeah, I, I wanna get a few more of their, the questions in because they're really good and they are plentiful. Um, let me group a couple together. Um, uh, Ron asks if, if you foresee spi increases, spikes in gun death suicides due to unemployment and depression. And then um, um, an anonymous attender is talking about increases of youth violence um, in, in their area. Uh, why might youth be turning to violence in these times? I know I saw something on the news that just this morning that Louisville, here where I am, it is uh, compared to a year ago, it, it, we've had an increase in violence. I, I think it was like 15%. And then on another program I heard in Chicago, I thought it was like 80 something percent. I mean, they are seeing real increases in violence. So increase of violence, um, among young people and then violence towards self, depression, suicide, um, I, I could see that happening as the economic situation worsens for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I, I think there's been a documented increase of domestic violence. Uh, there are, you know, right when we tell people to go home and stay safe, we're sending a lot of children home to houses that are not safe and houses where um, <coughs> caregivers are not giving care or helping pe kids to develop the the emotional and spiritual resources to be able to get through a time of anxiety and frustration. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the increase in youth violence speaks to the lack of um, resources that we provided to young people to cope with dissonance and anxiety and frustration. And, um, and the only antidote we see because the uh, the, the prevalence of guns and the prevalence of violence as a way to solve these kinds of experiences of dissonance is so powerful. It's such a powerful narrative in our society and the wherewithal to get those guns and other means of violence is very prevalent in our society. And so it's pretty natural that people who don't have other resources and are not being given those resources by responsible adults are going to turn to the resources they can get. Mm -hmm. Fear and anxiety produce reactivity and, and produce an us against them mentality. And, and we're just feeding it with the narrative that we're using that others can't be trusted and we're not safe. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's sad to say, but we, you know, we are seeing those correlates between suicide and, and uh, youth violence. Um, because we we already these these were already under addressed issues mm -hmm. that when you put yourself in a global crisis mm -hmm. they they just get worse and um you know i'm talking to uh, some of my colleagues this is this is a sort of a uh, chance for us in this country to sort of remake this country because there are so many unaddressed issues that this this it just this crisis just pushes us to a place where you can no longer sweep things under a rug, where you can no longer fail to address things, that, that, these, that this crisis puts many issues dead in front of our face and we have to address them 
or you know we'll just we'll just teeter into a place where it'll just pe- people are just there'll just be a such a big sense of of of, of hopelessness that that I, I don't know we just it it just pushes us to do something and to and to take some action because you know we're here yeah. disproportionate access to health care which is racially bound as well as uh tied to poverty and wealth um and the stigmatization of mental health as not being the same as other health care and also the disproportionate access to mental health resources uh, is really exposing our vulnerability in this area. And it's really showing the shame of our lack of will to get a health care system that works for everybody. Right. I'm going to just share a few of the comments and questions as we move toward <clears throat> closing. Clearly, this topic could have used an additional 30 minutes. Um, uh, but Hart Edmonds asked about faith leaders who oppose social distancing for their churches and still insist on in-person worship and may even approve of guns in their um, worship experiences. And, and uh, um, James talked about um, not really understanding scarcity as a stimulus for buying guns because people already own who are stockpiling them may already have 20 guns and lots of ammo. Um, also, my guess is that people of color are not the ones out there shopping in the gun sh- stores. Um, the, um, the Brent uh, talked about this situation where we have some marches happening on state capitals, and some of those are armed with military weapons. And he says, today they entered the Michigan State Assembly and shouted from the gallery while armed. I understand why some may protest wow. the lockdowns while not agreeing, but why would they be bearing arms other than for the purpose of to threaten? Um, so those are uh, interesting dynamics that um, are, are happening. Um, let's see. Well, there's some other folks that are talking about um, what their churches are doing. Um, uh, uh, we offered the upstairs building for the guests at the homeless shelter in our basement to sleep nice. and hang out so they could enforce social distancing. Um, mm-hmm. So we had 15 people sleeping throughout our church. I think it's all about where is the need and how you can answer it. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we had somebody from the Presbyterian Church of Nigeria who said, I'm glad that you're engaging in this kind of conversation and that I am a part of it. I wish to let you know that the All African Conference of Churches also are carrying out a similar campaign in Africa. Mm-hmm. So... All right. Um, Well, let me thank both of you very much for joining us today on this um, important uh, conversation. Um, uh, Let me uh, direct our viewers to some of the resources that we wanted to make sure they know that uh, you have shared with us. Yeah, so yeah, there we go. Lori. Lori is the uh, uh, co authored this book, Recovering from Unnatural Disasters A Guide for Pastors and Congregations After Violence and Trauma. Um, and so it is available from Westminster John Knox Press, but also, of course, on Amazon if you must. Uh, Robert. Uh, Hoggard is, a fe- is featured in an upcoming book, For the Sake of Peace, Africa. Afri- Americana perspectives, it's so tiny, on racism, justice, and peace in America. Mm -hmm. Um, And that book will be available on June 16th from Roman and Littlefield and will be available on Amazon. I have nothing against Amazon. uh, Okay, so um, there are two great reads from our panelists today. Our next webinar is going to be May 27th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. We will be focusing on the trauma recovery and rebuilding process in the wake of gun violence. We'll discuss the various stages of healing from the trauma of gun violence and the church's role in accompanying people through that healing process. We'll be uh, joined by Kathy Riley, who is the Associate for Emotional and Spiritual Care with Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. We'll also have Jim Kirk, who is the Associate for Disaster Response in the U.S. Cece Armstrong will be with us. She's a pastor in Charleston, South Carolina, 
and Bruce Wismar is a pastor in Sarasota, Florida, each with stories of their work in trauma recovery. Uh, as always, to register for upcoming webinars, just view uh, or to view um, past webinars, because we're creating an index of these, uh, visit the Peacemaking Programs website, which is listed here. Uh, go to Standing Our Holy Ground. All right. Well, thank you. It's been a, an hour well spent. Um, Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Simon. And thank you to all of you who've been with us today. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, goodbye.